it's on. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. That was some music at the end, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm here to do some questions, if you have some questions, to give you some answers. Um, anybody have anything they'd like to start off with? John? Uh, how did your mom and dad make it to America? Well, Dad um, went to, after they, they got out of Berlin with the help of General Eisenhower, because my great aunt had come to, um, my grandma's sister had come to New York in 1938 and was a well known person in, in Germany because of her husband. Anyway, so she had his contact, and um, they got out of Berlin in 1945. I was born in Heidelberg in 1946, which is where Dad had decided to go to the university because he never could do that before the war started. And then he came to America to get a master's degree on, on some kind of an international student program, um, and was here from 49 to 50, and then went back to Germany and got his PhD. And they had decided towards the end of the war that they thought they would like to live in America, but this was a great opportunity for him to see what life here would really be like, and it just confirmed that they wanted to come. So we immigrated in 1952, and it was in May, um, through one of the professors that he met when he was here getting his master's, he had a promise of a job, but no contract, because there was a law in effect at the time that no American company could contract with a German for employment because the Germans were still one of those awful bad people. So we came over here with, you know, on a bit of a prayer, I guess, but it worked out. Thank you. So, how did your grandmother um, make it out of the concentration camp? You know, that is a question that's asked at every um, one of these screenings, how my grandmother got out of the concentration camp. And honestly, the answer is nobody really knows. My mom had a uh, half-sister who was living in Switzerland, but she said that she was never successful in even talking to anybody in Switzerland about getting her out. And mom read a book in about 2000 that was written by Charles de Gaulle's niece, who was an inhabitant of the same concentration camp. And she was released with about 50 other women due to the good works of uh, Count Bernadotte, who was a Swede. Um, and he was able to save, I don't know, thousands of people from concentration camps. And he, there was this release around April of 1945. Um, and maybe she was swept up in that, although what happened was that the, the matron came in and said, here, here's your release papers. Get out. <laughs> and, she, and she just was all by herself on the street in front of this camp. So it wasn't like she was in a group of people. We just don't know what happened. You know, there are no records. You can't find stuff like that out. Well, there was a um, year when Hitler released people on April 20th, which was his birthday. And he, he released people that had that same birthday. And I wonder if that release might not have been somehow connected at that. Yeah, I knew about that. And I think, um, well, she was released April 11th. I'm not sure, I think it was the same year, because I think the Count Bernadotte release from that camp was actually after April 11th. And, and so, I mean, we just don't know how she got out. She, the whole time that she was in captivity, she um, would not speak. She pretended not to hear what anybody said to her, and they probably thought she was just an idiot. You know, maybe somebody felt sorry for her, and she was very beautiful, too. And, you know, mom, mom thought she weighed about 75 pounds when she got out. She was about 5'7", and she lost something like 40 pounds. Maybe somebody, I mean, there were these weird little acts of kindness sometimes. They re-arrested them 48 hours later if they hadn't left the uh, country, like one of my great-great-uncles was. So, so they got released, some people got released on his birthday, if, and if then... They, if they, he was born on Hitler's birthday, mm -hmm. he was told he could go, but he had to leave quickly or he would be rearrested. Mm -hmm. It was weird. I hope he made it. <laughs> Two days isn't a lot of time to get out and in the war zone. Yeah. I can't see who you are. Which baby are you? The, the first, first one. one. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth? Um, for those of us who had uh, American dads who fought on you know, this side, 
and never talked about their war experience. I wonder if your dad was also quiet, or did this story come out later, or did you hear about it when you were younger? Well, my first memory of hearing about it was in fifth grade we moved and I had to go to a new school. And I was the tallest kid in the class, except for a guy named Rodney King, who was white. <laughs> um, and he was sort of the class bully. And, and he called me Nazi. You're a Nazi. That was his name for me. And I went home and asked mom, what, what did that mean? And then that was the first time I remember hearing about Nazis. And then I don't really remember conscious, I don't, I'm not conscious of, of hearing these stories after that, but I think gradually over time, I certainly did, and my dad, when we moved to California right before I went to high school, and he was um, going around out there giving talks about the resistance and his role in the July 20th plot, because people still thought, this is 1959, people still thought that all Germans were Nazis, that was a very common thing to think, and he wanted to make sure that people knew what the truth was. So at that point, when I was in high school, I really got it. Chuck. What are, um, I don't know when you were born exactly, but what are your memories, if any, of post-war Germany before you came to the US? <laughs> I remember going to kindergarten there. We came here just before I turned six. Um, and I remember the little house that my parents built. I don't really, you know, my family, my grandparents, we, my parents went on a six week goodbye trip to Europe before we came because they weren't sure they'd ever come back. And my brother and I went to, to stay with my grandparents then. You know, it's mostly, they're mostly family members. I don't remember anything about hard times or lack of food, anything like that. Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, a friend of my husband's um, from college um, lived, they still live up in Lebanon, and my mom was living up at Eastman in Grantham, and um, through us, they met, um, and he knew the story, he knew my mom's story, and his son is the filmmaker. So he t suggested to his son, this would make a great film, <laughs> and his son got to know my mom. My mom had been a, a teacher of, um, the daughter in that family, but she had never met the son, and so that's how it came about. He interviewed mom and videoed her for about three years. Mom is a, she was a born storyteller. So. <laughs> she was, um, during these three years of interviews, I mean, she was all over the place. It was never a chronological story, so it was an incredibly difficult thing to make this film. And finally, you know, he, he got to know her well enough that she had written a book for our family, which we, allowed him to look at too, and he um, crafted together a bit more chronological story which turned into this film. Um, but it was, it was a few years of work. Yeah. Um, how well did your parents adapt to American life? Did they embrace it? Did they enjoy it? Did they miss home? Um, I just wondered what the transition was like for them. Well, I... I I don't remember much about myself learning English. I do remember making a few comments in German to my teacher in first grade because my English wasn't that good yet. They had both had English in school, but it was British. I had an American teacher for a while too. Um, and Dad had to speak at work a lot. So my memory is that at home we spoke English always at the beginning, anyway, so that we would learn. And then Mom always said that the hardest thing she thought was the sense of humor, you know, the kind of jokes that you make in Germany wouldn't be very funny here that something got lost in translation, so it took a while to catch on to that. But they were really into being American. Um, we had our German Christmas traditions, our Easter traditions, family traditions, those kinds of things. Um, we never had Christmas on Christmas morning. We always had Christmas Eve, and we had all the German Christmas Eve stories, so, we, you know, that kind of thing was preserved, but they dove right into American life. They were determined to just love it here, and they did. Anybody else? Claudia, you uh, mentioned Eisenhower playing a role in your family being able to come over. And uh, could you elaborate on that a little? And well, my, my grandmother's sister was married to Gustav Schlesemann, who was the foreign minister during the Weimar Republic. He'd actually been a chancellor, the chancellor for the first three months of the Republic, and then he was foreign minister until he died in 1929. And he won a Nobel Peace Prize with R.C. Brion for the for the uh, Locarno Pact, which you know made 
a better peace for the Germans and the French. Um, well, it wasn't just for that, but it was that was the, the moving force, I think. So he died in 1929, and my great aunt and her two sons came over here in 1938 when they could still get out. Um, and she, you know, she was well known because you're in those diplomatic circles, people know who you are. So she had some kind of contact that made a contact for her with General Eisenhower. I don't know exactly what the details are. But my parents got a letter from somebody that was signed by Eisenhower, actually. I think we still have it, saying, help these people get out of Berlin. It was hard because the Russians were all around Berlin, right? And Berlin, they were in the western part of Berlin, which ended up being the American zone. Um, and it, it wasn't easy to get out with your stuff, and it wasn't safe. So this Lieutenant Tuthill, who had been delegated with making the trip safe for them, drove some kind of a, they called, mom called it a carry-all. I'm not sure what that is. And then they had some kind of a car, some broken down old Volkswagen. Um, and they just made a small procession to get into Western Germany. Sandy? Yeah, you know, because mom said that my dad went home that night and destroyed everything, but she kept, she had her letters that he wrote to her somewhere that he didn't know about, and I'm, you know, not sure exactly where that was. It was somewhere in the house. And actually, nobody ever came into the house to ransack it. The Gestapo used it as a, a radio listening post for a while um, when they were all in prison, but um, there wasn't any, you know, big search. Um, so, I think my dad's films, he came from Cologne, and um, he, his mother died in the fall of 1942 of natural causes, and he had to go back and, and take care of all the affairs and took stuff out of the house where she was living and took it out into the country in the alsace lorraine area, in the German part, to a farmer that he knew, and the farmer just kept all the stuff for him. There was jewelry, there was silver, um, you know, and, and, I, and the films, and the film footage, he might have actually had a lot of that on him because we have a movie that he took, um, A Day in the Life of a German Soldier in Russia, which is his regiment. You know, he showed how they got, where they got up, how they got washed. It was really, a, it was quite a story. So some of that war footage is from that. And some of the war footage is just from films that are publicly available, too. It wasn't all my dad's. Well, the movie's an hour. Her book is about 250 pages. So there are a lot of details and there are a lot of um, coincidences that aren't in that movie. One sort of funny one is um, after they were all out of the prisons, you had to get around Berlin somehow. It was mostly a wreck and bicycles became very important. And my dad got a hold of a bicycle. You could see the tricks that he did, right? That was the beginning. So at one point he got stopped by a bunch of Russian soldiers who demanded his bicycle. And he was on an errand and he was not going to give up that bicycle. And so he showed them all the tricks he could do. And they were so impressed. And these Russians were, you know, 14, 15 year old boys at that point, where right? they had gone six deep in their supply of men to, to do the fighting. And they thought it was so great that he could do this. I said, oh, just keep the bicycle. So <laughs> he told me about riding away on his bike, thinking they're going to shoot me in the back. <laughs> um, and, and then one other thing is there is a little more detail about the, the uh, doctor's visit. Mom, in the two weeks that she had after her parents were arrested, and when she turned herself in, which she did, by the way, because she thought that by going and playing innocent, she could actually help her parents. Well, of course, they saw right through that. Um, one of her friends really wanted her to leave Germany, but that would have been really dangerous, and she might not have survived. So anyway, uh, she arranged in that two-week period um, with a doctor who was a friend of a friend to give to send her placebo injections that she could request from the prison, and then the medic in the prison would administer those. And the medic, she had twelve of those. And the medic was a guy named Frosch, which means frog in German, and she said he was. Look kind of like a little frog. He was really sweet. He just took to her, and he was a communist himself, and in the end, he was killed by the Russians, ironically. Um, he was, I think he might have actually been a prisoner also, because they did have some prisoners that were working in the 
prisons, and he, just because he liked mom, they developed this relationship, and she figured she could trust him, and messages were coming back and forth from friends that she had arranged during that two-week period. Um, she had set up this communications network so that she could always find out as much as any of her friends knew about what was going on with my grandparents and my dad. Um, and then one of the friends, the, the house that they went to as they came out of prison, he was an old general and he'd been fired in the um, late 30s because he wasn't, you know, he was too old, too useless. And he, he just wanted to see her, so he arranged with this medic to come to the prison. Mom couldn't believe it, and the medic went to her and he said, I have a surprise for you. You have to hide in this courtyard behind these three trash cans and don't make a sound. And so she did. She had no idea what was going to happen. And um, she said, what if somebody finds you? He said, don't worry, they're all at lunch. <laughs> So he went away, he came back, and she looked out, and there's this big old guy, you know, the general, the friend coming, they had her just, they were just, it was just the best thing that happened to her in prison. Um, and then a, a Gestapo guy or an SS man, whoever was in the prison, came by with a couple of dogs, and the dogs were totally not crazy to go over the garbage cans. But um, the general stood up and, you know, saluted, and he was still wearing his uniform. Um, and so the, the guy took the dogs away. That was a close call. Some other little stories like that, but those are two that stand out. Steph? When your parents came here, were they politically active? And do you remember mm -hmm. any um, things that they had that were incredibly important? Well, I remember the election of 1950s, well, 52. That was the first election, and we were here for that. I don't, we didn't have a TV, and I don't really, I was just six, I don't really remember that. But I, I do remember 1956, we watched it, and they allowed us to do it too at night, the conventions of both parties. Um, and we talked about, you know, the candidates and what they represented and that kind of thing. And I'm not sure, my mom, more than my dad, because he had a, a job with tougher hours, um, was always involved in political campaigns, locally and um, I guess more than locally too. Like, for example, she ended up in, in 1968, she was the head of the Bobby County campaign in Princeton, New Jersey. And that was probably her biggest, her biggest uh, campaign job. Brandon, Brandon. <laughs> at the beginning of the film, I believe they said they determined that your mother was half Jewish, but it didn't seem, if I remember correctly, that she was being singled out to be arrested. Is that, um, did I miss something there, or is, was that because she was only half Jewish? Well, there was, it's interesting, I was just reading something today. There was, in 1941, um, Goebbels, who was the propaganda minister, kept a diary, and in 1941, Hitler apparently said to him, Let's not go after, let's go lightly after the Jews who are married to Aryans. So that would be my grandmother. Um, my mother is considered a mission, which is a, a mixed, mixed race. They consider Jews a race. Um, and they were just really careful. You know, mom left high school.